Now, Guy Needler, we've flown him in from London. And his wife came all the way from England for, to be here at this conference. <laughs> and when Guy first sent me the manuscript, now his book is The History of God. The story of the beginning of everything. And you see, in your real life, you're, uh, what, you're, what is it? You, I can't remember I'm what. An, I'm an engineer, basically. Engineer? Engineer. And interestingly enough, if I was to use Walter's two word description of what I am, I would say I'm God's engineer. I'm <laughs> amazed at how many of my authors are engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them have never been into metaphysics. Of course, the guy is different. But I was really surprised at how many of them, they have that analytical mind, and yet they write these wonderful books. Like Jack Churchward yesterday is an engineer. That's why he wouldn't answer the questions. He said, I gotta know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's that engineer mentality. <laughs> but That's amazing. But anyway, on the surface, they all look normal. <laughs> I do have to say, Dolores, that my wife does think I'm a bit of an alien, so, <laughs> so that's another but story. When Guy first sent me his manuscript, uh, it was amazing because it had so much material that I hadn't uh, had anybody submit, uh, going back to the beginnings and all of that. Um, but then, uh, most of the book was good, and then you went off in a different direction. And I thought, well, it'll be okay. Then he sends me a second book. And at, I said, this part belongs in the first one. Because a lot of it was explaining how it all came about and how uh, he, put, he learned how to do all of this. So I said, if you'll let me do it, I always tell the authors, you let me work on it, we'll have a book. If I have authors that say, no, nobody's touching my baby, then I say, well, then it'll never be published because I know what makes a good book. So I said, we met in uh, Oxford. That's right, yeah. I had to go over to England last year for a class to do one of my classes, and you met with me. And I said, if you let me combine the books, we'll make it into one book. Because I knew I wasn't going to put that on you. No. It was too big of a job. Yeah. And also, I mean, you could just tell that Dolores is a master, so yeah, let the master get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> As for you, trust me to do it. I that was what totally. Stuart and Joanna's books, too. Yeah. I said, let me handle it and we'll have a book. So if you let me do it, that's the way yeah. it works. But um, so anyway, I worked on it, and our Another, we have another editor, and she's been helping with the con Itira. And you're back there, aren't you? She does, I do first editings, and Julie does, and Itira does final editings. And I told her what I was going to do, and she said, I want no part of it. You do it. And I think that you do the final editing after I combined the two, didn't you? Yeah, I played around just a few things needed to be really Yeah, because there was a huge amount of material. And we had to interweave the whole thing. So anyway, well, I have a very active part in this company too. <laughs> so we ended up, we've got us a good book now. And I know no, they told you we had nine books that had to go to the printers all at the same time to get here in time for this conference. And that was a big job. And they arrived two days before the conference. So all of these books are fresh off of the press. So anyway, his book is The History of God. And what's unique about Guy, he'll be explaining how he does this. He's able, you're talking about third dimensions, fourth dimension, different levels. He has been able to go, what is it, up to the 60th, 70th? There's, uh, there's, a, there's an arbitrary level of 100 levels, um, which are questioned because it seems a bit too round number. But the, those, those levels can be divided into dependent upon the individual's abilities. But in terms of dimensions, in, there's, two, there's two entities I talk about. One's called the source entity, which is the creator of our multiverse. And the second's called the origin. And that is the creator of our creator. Mm -hmm. And the number of dimensions, or 
shall I say, permutations of space. Each permutation of space is a universe in its own right. I've we, never heard of anyone who could go into these higher, yeah, higher levels. As it's funny, some morning you got there one night and they said, what are you doing here? You're not <laughs> supposed to be at this right. level. Okay, so I'm gonna let uh, Guy tell the story. But uh, we thought it was important for you to come from England to be here for this yeah, conference. Thank you very much. So it's the history of God. What? Slowly, yes. I can't hear yeah. from here. <laughs> I couldn't hear without the microphone. Oh, she's asked to speak slowly because of my English accent. So we'll do, we'll do what we can. <laughs> okay. Okay, but now I'm going to turn it over to Guy and hope he's thinks it's worth the trip coming here. Thank you. Like him and his wife, Anne. Okay, Guy Needler. Okay, so I'd just like to thank Dolores for uh, inviting me over here to, to Arkansas to, to do this presentation. Um, one thing I have noticed is the energy here has been absolutely fantastic. The, the, the amount of energy from the different individuals, from the, from the whole of the transformation conference has been really quite up, uplifting. The, the lecture I'm going to give you is about an hour and five minutes, hour and ten minutes. Uh, and it's, it's got five... I'm here. Is it turned on? Yeah? It's turned on okay? Can we turn this microphone up a bit? How's this? No, it's not, no, it's not covered. No. That's better, is it? Okay. So, yeah. Can you hear me, all hear me okay now? Yes? Excellent. Okay. So the, the lecture is going to last for an hour and, hour and five minutes, hour and ten minutes. And I've got five sub, uh, summaries throughout for your mental comfort because there's quite a few concepts in there that you might find di slightly difficult to understand because the information I get from the source sensed in the origin, um, although I understand it at an intuitive level and can and recognize what the, what the information is, even I sometimes can't put it into words, so I have to use engineering terminology or things that we do as human beings to enable us to, or to enable me, to explain it to you. Okay. So, uh, oh, oh, and at the, at, the, at the end, what I'd like to try and do with everybody here, including the people who are being, receiving this uh, conference via streaming, is to just teach you all together how to raise yourselves up through just seven of the levels, those, those levels that go to the, the edge of the spiritual physical um, the intermediate stroke astral levels that are part of our unique human form. Okay, so that would be an experiment at the end. It involve all of us, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it because the, the instructions are in the back of the the book, the history of God, uh, so you can take it away and enjoy it on, on your own. If we've got time for questions and answers at the end, um, then fine, we'll do some. Other than that, if you, if you write them down, and we can deal with them at the end in the in the book signing area. If any of you want to try and experiment to go further with the, 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 um, the work that I do at the end of the lecture, then I'm quite happy to, do, to help you do that uh, again in, in lunchtime. Okay. So, uh, where are we? Okay. So here's the content, so what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about my awakening, um, or should I say, my work in progress awakening, because I now realize that although I understand and can work with certain entities, that is very much work in progress. And I'm going to go over very, very, very shortly the journey, how I started to journey amongst the frequencies and what the process was that allowed me to do that, and the different entities that I met along that way. And, and these are only a few of the entities that I met, that I met but they're the first entities and the relevance of the book. We also want to go through a short history of the creator of our multiverse, the, the entity that identified itself as the source entity, and the creator of it, the origin, that that is the absolute. And I want to describe the spiritual physics surrounding that multiverse, including how the dimensions are overlaid, how we can have all of these universes existing at the same time, 
the frequencies that inflate those dimensions, and what happens to us when we travel lower down the frequencies, because there's a significant amount of things that happen to us. And I also want to go over something else that happens within this, universe, this multiverse, and that is um, that age-old bone of contention, time. And I want to describe what it, what it really is. Then I want to change the, the, the direction slightly and indicate why we are here, the importance of the Earth and the creation of mankind, and illustrate some of the spiritual functions of, of RNA and how it interfaces with DNA, because there are functions there that are not known by uh, scientists and, uh, med and medical scientists. Um, the, three in one, the unique three-in-one aspect of mankind will also be discussed because we exist in three planes con con uh, consecutively. So we're not just in the physical, we exist in, in, in the spiritual, physical, and the, 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 the spiritual as well. Um, before I go to the bigger picture, which is a message from the source sensitive to us all, I'd like to go through karma. Because karma, I believe, is, um, is greatly misunderstood. And there's a lot of energetic issues surrounding karma. And it's quite an insidious um, piece of energy that we need to work with and understand. So I want to go through the process of my awakening now. Okay. I've had a lifelong interest in the metaphysical, uh, right from a very early age, so say eight. And I've had a lot of different experiences of metaphysical origin. Um, one of my early, earliest memories is, is lying in my bed at home and uh, looking across and seeing the wind rise up through the wall of my next door neighbor's house, across the roof, around the chimney, and down the other side. And that was an interesting observation because there's a wall and another house in between the house I was looking at. So I didn't realize at the time, but I was actually seeing through two houses to see this. And I shouted down to my mother, Mom, Mom! I can see the wind. And she said, son, don't be so stupid. Nobody can see the wind. I wonder what Cinema and Crow would have said about that as a, as a mother. <laughs> so she, uh, she, she, my dear old mother, she, uh, she didn't quite understand what was going on there. I've also had a number of different uh, episodes of astral traveling um, when I've been in my dream and then suddenly realized I'm outside and I've been, and there's a completely different feeling about astral traveling versus being in a dream. Completely different feeling. There's a completely different uh, aura about the, the atmosphere that you're in. So I understood that as being astral travelling. I've also had uh, a number of instances of understanding my past lives. And um, one of those was, was recognising that I returned from somewhere, uh, probably around the 15th, 16th century, to comfort a number of truth seekers that were huddled together in an upstairs room, hiding away from what I recognize now as being something like the witch finder generals. And, and, and they were very surprised to see me. And I, I, I said, so it's okay, I'm here, I'm here. And they said, well, you're dead. I said, well, I'm here. And then I remembered that they'd caught me and had hung, drawn, and quartered me. But that felt okay for some reason because it was my body that had suffered the problem and not my energetic body. And I was still there. And those individuals in that, in that, in that dream and meditation they were there to help doing what we're doing now, which is to raise the frequencies of the earth. So, with all of these different th things that were happening to me, I, I ended up doing quite a lot of meditation during my teens, and I, and I devoured a number of texts that showed me how to meditate properly. And during one of these waking moments where I started to lie in my bed and sort of take, take in that moment where you're, you're lying down, you're meditating, you're calm, there's nothing happening around you, I suddenly was transported to an area where there was th three people in front of me. And there they were, three men in white robes, all smiling, all nodding, all exuding perfect love. And although they didn't speak to me, they communicated with me in a telepathic method. And I knew that they were telling me that what I was doing was right. What I understood was right. The feelings that I had throughout my life to that point, and I still continue to have, about having something really quite important to do, were right. But not then. It wasn't the right time. And from that point onwards, I, I really put things in the back burner. And although I kept my sort of spiritual one eye open on, on various different texts and was interested in certain metaphysical subject matters, I really didn't go into the same level of depth that I had done um, with those meditation days previously. And that happened for basically 20 years. 
And in those 20 years, I was more engrossed in the physical. I became management within the business I was working for. I gained two master's degrees, different subjects. I gained chartered and electrical engineering uh, recognition, which is quite high qualifications, recognized European-wide. And really wasn't quite interested at all until a friend introduced me to Reiki. And I went to a couple of Reiki shares and started to feel energies back in my hands. I thought, well, this is interesting. And within 12 months, I became a Reiki master. Just at the point of reaching a Reiki master, I was going to an energy healer um, in Birmingham who was a, a direct student of Barbara Brennan. If you remember the, the Hands of Light books, for those of you who have read those books, they're fantastic. And Barbara Brennan is a, um, was an NASA scientist, and so everything she was describing in these books that um, were part of the course re are related to, in, you know, full stop. So my energy healer said that she was going to start a course, and she was having a suck it and see weekend. Uh, suck it and see means try it, by the way. Um, and would I be interested? And I said, yes, we'll go along. And she invited a gentleman called Rolf Stein, who ran the, the Snow Lion Center in Switzerland. And, the, and he was also a direct student of, of Barbara Brennan. And uh, that, that weekend was wonderful, and I really felt that this was the, the thing for me. So from that point onwards, I committed myself to four years of energy healing training based upon Brennan Healing Science. And I have to say, it was extremely difficult work and hard work, very searching, because there was a psychotherapy content to it where you had to develop yourself and get rid of your own, um, your own bad energies and, 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 and bad thinking processes based upon the work of uh, Susan and, Don and Donovan Tasenga and uh, John and Eva Piriakos. Uh, very searching work, and it, it sorts you out. And, and it's, it's something we have to keep referring to all the time. But within that work, there was also uh, an element of learning how to channel and learning how to do past life healing as well as healing on different, other different levels. Now, around this time, um, the work colleague who showed me how to do Reiki or came in, into my life and, and introduced me to Reiki had moved to Sweden. And he'd, he'd moved to, moved to work with another car company. And, we, and my wife, Anne, and I decided we'd have a, a cheap holiday. We'd go over there and we'd stay with him and uh, we'd look around Sweden. And the place he stopped at and, and worked at was a place called Trollhattan, which is um, not too far away from Gothenburg. Now, my friend's also quite intuitive, and he received during meditation a message. And that message was he had to take me on a certain walk. And that certain walk was in this area here. And this river is just, uh, just downstream of Trollhattan. And we walked through these woods, from the back of his house, his house was over this way somewhere, and we walked through all these woods, down a towpath, and as we're walking down the towpath, the energies changed from being normal to being extremely high. My hands were tingling, then my arms were tingling, then my whole body was tingling, and we all noticed that, and we thought, good grief, the energies are really high here. So I was walking down this towpath, and there was a rock. You can't see it here, but just about there. And this rock was quite a large, sizable rock, and it was totally um, out of the way of, of, of the towpath. It was like a little island. And I felt a, a desperate need to go on this rock and meditate, which I did. So my friend and my wife, Anne, carried along, and they walked up the towpath to this bridge, because they felt the need to go onto this bridge and observe what was going on. And as they observed what was going on, they, they felt that they were tuning into the energies. The energies that they felt, felt otherworldly. They didn't feel as if they were from Earth. They didn't feel magnetic. They didn't feel like they were part of any energy healing that anybody's done. Anything to do with Earth, they felt otherworldly. And when they focused their perception, and, this, and I found this out later, by the way, they said that they felt that there was entities or, or, or beings or vehicles hovering around the area where I was meditating. And then I was receiving a level of attunement or rewiring of my capabilities to let me access that which I wasn't currently able to do so. Anyway, while, this, uh, while they're experiencing this, I'm receiving what I can only describe as a severe piece of attunement. And it, it totally knocked, my, knocked me out. Um, 
Afterwards, I, could, I couldn't string a sentence together, and that lasted for three days, really quite heavy. So, as part of the, the attunement, that led to extra functions that I got when I was receiving the training for the Brennan Healing Science. And when we do Brennan Healing Science, or any form of energy healing, you need to be able to reverse the levels, those levels that are associated with the human aura, which are, have a frequency of their own right. To enable you to move around, affect healing at the chakras at different levels, remove different parts of the chakras, replace them, do spying, cleansing, remove astral entities that are attached themselves to you, uh, affect changes to the etheric templates and the etheric body to repair the physical body, and, and do um, modifications to organs and things. And during this time, we were moving up and down these levels, and, and, and you know, we had sp specific lessons in, in able to do this. I noticed I could go higher, and as I went higher, um, I found I was experiencing different different levels to the human body. And at this point, my, my teacher reprimanded me severely for not being grounded. And uh, this happens quite a few times because really the course content only worked on seven levels. But I recognized that there were these 10 levels associated with the human form. And, and they got a level of structure. And the first three levels were consistent with what we were being taught. And they were to do with the, the physical, the physical body. And rather than the fourth level being the intermediate and astral, and that being the mixing pot between the spiritual and the physical worlds, there were actually four. And they were more spiritual physical than, than intermediate and astral. And as I looked further and got more adept, the other three, the eighth, ninth, and tenth, I noticed, were more spiritual. So the human body exists on three planes at the same time. Physical, intermediate spiritual, or spiritual physical, and purely spiritual. And as I progressed further, and I invented uh, a little methodology that is, is in the book, by the way, so um, and we might be able to use it later on as part of this, the end of this lecture, to enable me to move further than those 10 levels. And as I, as I did this, I found that there was 14 levels associated with the, the physical universe. And that those 14 levels are encompassed by one bigger frequency band, and I'll, I'll come into that later. So I was getting quite adept at this, um, this moving up and down the frequencies and at least staying at 14. And then one day I found I could go higher than 14 to 15. And at this point, I started to meet other entities. And these are just a few of them that I met and there's been others since. So the first entities I contact was, well, the first one was Byron, um, who was called something else. So I'm going to go into them in some detail as, as I go through. Then I perceived and ended up communicating with some aliens in Crete. We have a little holiday home in, on the Cretan Hills. And during one, one meditation session, I established there was, again, otherworldly energies there. And when I started to focus my attention on, on the hillsides, there was you know, extraterrestrials there. And then there's the OM. Uh, another set of entities that I now know pervade the known multiverse. But also, I found with patience and with more meditation and more experience and using the, the arbitrary method I was using, which is quite mechanical, I have to add, and took quite a bit of time, I managed to go above the level 100 that was in my mind. It's an arbitrary level that I think that um, anybody can use as, as, as a figure. And that level led me to a larger entity, a much larger entity, that an entity itself has been the source entity, God. And it, it started to have some dialogue with me, which was you know, fantastic from my perspective. I thought I'd made it. And then I found I could go higher. <laughs> and as I went higher, I went into another plane, a completely different plane, and established that there was another entity above that, and that was called the origin. So the first entity, Byron, okay, 
It was an entity I met on the 27th level when I was moving up and down these levels. I was trying to use either trap doors to get up there or a mental lift to move myself up and down different levels. And I got to the 27th level and I met this entity called Byron. Now, Byron um, initially tried to scare me off. I shouldn't be here, he said. You're from Earth. You're not supposed to go above the third level, let alone the 27th level. What are you doing here? And it read my mind and presented itself as a dragon. So I initially called it the dragon entity. And it kept trying to shoo me off. Uh, wrong. I'm not worried about things like that. So I kept on going. And eventually, it, uh, it started to work with me and started to tell me what it really was. And I established that it, it exists on a planet, in a galaxy, in a completely different universe to mankind. And that as a result of that, he experiences a level of physicality, but, a, but relevant to his dimensionality, his permutation of space. And his bodily form is metamorphic. And it's metamorphic because he changes his bodily form relevant to the type of work he's doing. And I experienced this again when he, was, when he called himself the, the um, well, I, when I called him the, the dragon entity, because he, he, he had this dragon form, and he thought the dragons would scare me off. And then eventually he, he, he adopted a more humanoid form, because he realized that I wasn't going to move away, and the humanoid form would be uh, more congenial to our communications. Now, Byron's race are a collective race. Although they have individuality, they, are, they work for a collective, for the collective, to make sure the collective evolves. And what's more, they work with the planet or the area of local density that they exist and work around to help that evolve as well. So their work is to do with working together in evolution. Now, one year, my wife and I went on a holiday in Crete, and the, the area that we, we live in is, uh, is just over, over here. We have a little place there, okay? And there's a wonderful roof area where I can sit on and just be. And it's great. You can sit there and be. You can watch all the birds flying around, the insects flying around, and you, know, you look at them all and you think, wow, they've got, they've got purpose, this lot. They they're just working with nature. And I was absorbing nature and being part of it. And as I just was absorbing nature and being part of it, I tuned in a bit deeper, and I found that there was energy signatures that weren't of the area. So I tuned my perception to the area and found that there was what I can only describe as balconies or bases and areas where, where craft could, could come and go. And so all these mountain places here were surrounded by balconies and, and little buildings and, and stuff, and all, all around here as well. And that it was full of basically alien technology. So I contacted these aliens and I said, well, what are you doing here? This is quite a backward little island. We've, I mean, no, Greece is, uh, is not particularly well uh, civilized in, in some of the island areas. And, and they said, well, we've come here to experience and understand and, and, and observe mankind working with nature. And the older Greeks work with nature. Well, the younger Greeks don't so much because they're more involved with materialism. But the older Greeks work with nature still. And that's important, because if you're working with nature, you're working with the source entity. So that's what they were there for, to, work, to watch mankind working with nature. So I asked some further questions as to why they were here and what they were doing. And they said, well, we, can, we travel between the stars and the galaxies by using a method of frequency level translation. They move through the frequencies. And to do that, once they've, they've, they've moved, they use their mental intention to allow them to travel from place to place. And they can do that because the frequencies and dimensions, in some instances, are overlapped. Or they can use a mechanical energetic construct to force the issue for them. And I'll come into this business about them being overlapped or not overlapped later. But they use entities to make them do these dimensional jumps to move around. But what they did say is that they use an energetic vehicle to help them to come down to our frequency. Because when they come down to our frequency, they lose function. And again, I'll come into this later, because we lose function as well as a result of us 
being incarnate within the physical. So, one of the other entities that I contacted was an entity called Hum. Now, that's not his real name. I just could not write or understand his real name. So we settled on Hum, okay? And <laughs> an arbitrary name. And Hum is one of the Om, and the Om pervade the multiverse. So he's, he's, he's one of the Om. And he's beloved, by, he's beloved of the Om. The Om love him, and he loves the Om. They exist in a, in a love-like state. And he was sent to assist me in my early dialogues with the source entity and the origin to maintain and establish a robust link, which is, which is pretty much there right now, actually. In those days, it was quite difficult for me to, to get there without probably half an hour of meditation. But these days, the link is already there. And Hum was there to help with that, help with that and maintain that link. Now, the Um exist in the heaven levels, uh, right close to the source entity. And in fact, they're a really old race of, of, of energetic light beings. Um, now, when the, the source entity created the, the entities that, that, that exist within the multiverse it created, and it cast out its energy to create these entities, um, you'll read in the book that it didn't quite have its attention placed in the right place at the right time. Hence, we have different kingdoms of... Um, of entity. But the Om were created first as part of this, this, this casting out of energy. And as a result, they, they, they are very old and very wise and, and very loving. And they don't need to incarnate at all. Some of them do, at great expense to themselves, but they do it to help evolution of, 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 the, of the multiverse. And although they, are, they pervade the multiverse, and are part of the background of the essence of the multiverse, they come to Earth to help the Earth evolve and us evolve. And the Earth is quite, in fact, is very important, and I'll come to that later, because one of the things that um, you will estab we'll establish is that although we talk about the Earth ascending, there's much more at stake. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly summarize before I move on. So I've had uh, many spiritual experiences during my, my mid-teens, which resulted in my, my awakening being delayed and then reactivated later. My study of energy healing and uh, Reiki and Brennan healing science triggered the awakening process in my early 40s. And through the visit to Sweden, which incidentally ended up with a five-year commitment to go there, and I received subsequent top-ups, as it were, during those five years, resulted in me enabling my, my, my spiritual vision and, and faculties to be more, more, more awakened and allowed me to communicate with those entities that we've just discussed, such as Byron, the, the aliens, and, and Hum and the Um. And that also allowed me to swiftly progress to me communicating on the very high frequencies which resulted in my communication with the source entity and the origin. And the rest of this lecture really goes into some of the information, some of the data that I've accrued over the years in, in my communication with them. So, part of that is a short history of the origin. Now, the origin is the absolute. It is everything. It is the all. There is nothing else. It is sentient energy, frequency, and dimension. Self-aware sentient energy and frequency and dimension. And it has a level of structure. Within it, it has 12 zones, 12 full dimensions that are constructed of three tritaves or, or, or dimensional components, and 12 frequencies to each full dimension. And that would give you something like 5,183 different permutations of space if you were going to work it out. Now, as pure isness or, 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 or energy, the source, the, sorry, the origin, when it became self aware, started to investigate itself. It dipped into some of the zones and some of the dimensions and some of the frequencies. But it noticed that when it did this, specifically when it went down the lower frequencies, it started to learn. 
and experience. And it's the learning and the experience that led to evolution. And the origin thought, well, this is good. I like this evolution bit. I want some more. So it derived a strategy. And that strategy was to create 12 more versions of itself, separate to itself, external to itself, all given the same opportunity and criteria and energy sets that it had when it became aware. Now, for one reason or another, uh, I can't go into it in any depth here, that failed. Can't understand why, and, and, the, and I've not interrogated the origin to understand why either. But that led to the origin retracing its steps and creating a new strategy. In this instance, it gave up half, ran about half of itself and created 12 source entities, which were all created in equality, were all created inside the environment that was the, the origin, and were all lesser to itself, so that they all knew that they were part of something else. And as they become self, became self-aware, the origin would contact them and tell them what their reason for existence was. So our source entity was created by the origin. And it's a singular energy source left to its own devices. And once it was self-aware, it was contacted by the origin and given a task. And that task was to experience and evolve in any way possible. It was up to it. It didn't matter how it did it. It experienced and it evolved. And it would pass that evolution content naturally onto the origin. So as the source entity evolved, the origin would evolve. Now in part of its response to this, it decided to create a multiverse, loosely based upon the structure of the, of the origin. And it populated it with entities. Half of itself was given up to environment and entities. And each of those entities, although they have different levels because of the amount of intention that the source entity gave to it when he created these entities, are individualized units of source entity. So when you consider that, that us in our energetic state, and the little bit of us that's projected into the physical, are parts of the, the source entity, we are all parts of God. We're all part of the source entity. So, and our role, I'll come to in a moment. But first, I want to go over the spiritual physics of the source entities multiverse. The source entity's multiverse is based upon the origin's multiverse, but it doesn't have the 12 zones. It has 12 dimensions, 12 frequencies, and 12 tritaves. And each dimension, frequency, and tritave component creates an individual permutation of space, a universe as far as we're concerned. And if, if we want to try and consider how this works, this, the source entity gave me a concept to think about. And he said, well, consider the, the barrels on a combination padlock. And that each of those barrels has a number on it. And when you're trying to open a combination padlock, every time you turn the barrel once, the number changes. You have a different permutation of code. And that's a good way of thinking about how many different permutations of space we've got. Because there are 12 times 12 times 3 which if you've got quick maths is 432, except it's not, it's 430. And the reason why it's 430 different universes in our multiverse is because the base dimension, the first dimension, which is inflated by 12 frequencies, and each frequency, by the way, contains all of the frequencies that we have ever measured, for instance, in the physical universe, or will ever measure in the physical universe. And that full dimension is created by the three uh, basic dimension, uh, dimensional components of a tritave, those first ones in that first dimension equals one. So it has to be a base dimension. And guess where we are? Dimension one, frequency one. So we're about as low as we can get. Okay? That's comforting, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> the only way is up, gentlemen and ladies. The only way is up. Okay? So there's a lot out there. 
And the source entity then described to me how those dimensions work. And the full dimensions, so we'll ignore the tritabes right now, are grouped, and they're grouped in, in threes. So the first three dimensions are grouped in three, one, two, and three. Second group is grouped in three, four, five, and six, and so on and so on. But those dimensions, those full dimensions in those groups are linked together. And they're linked together to allow entities of the right evolutionary content to move freely around those dimensions and those frequencies. Now, I previously talked about the aliens using technology to do it, and that's quite okay. You can force the issue by using the right level of energetic technology to move through frequencies and dimensions. But what I'm talking about here is an entity's ability to do it of its own volition, based upon pure evolutionary level and intention. And if you've got a chance to read that, basically the source entity gave me an example of how a seventh dimensional entity can move around a couple of dimensions within its own linked group and move backwards and forwards. But a seventh dimensional entity can't move to the ninth dimension unless it's got the right level of evolutionary content. Of course, you can force the issue with um, engineering, but you know, if it wants to go on its own, of its own evolutionary content, it needs to, to evolve. If it wants to go down to the, to the next group down, which is the sixth, fifth, and fourth level, okay, the second group of three, it needs to create a, um, an energetic construct to help it do that, specifically because of how it might lose its own faculties. And similarly, uh, an entity that's, say, at the top of that, that first group, the, the ninth dimension, can only go to the tenth dimension, which is the next group upwards as a function of evolution. Okay, so if we've got all of these different dimensions existing concurrently, how the hell does that work? How can we understand that? We can't even work out how time works, let alone understanding how different dimensions go in there. So the source entity gave me a number of concepts, which I've previously explained are intuitively understood by myself, but inherently unexplainable in English language. So it said to me, well, let's think about things that mankind does that proves that things can happen at the same time. And for those of you who are engineers out there, uh, please excuse some of the possible mis mistakes. Those of you who aren't, I'll try and make it simple. This is a, an example of how frequency modulation, FM radio, signals can be transmitted. And you have a single... Uh, carrier wave, and then a piece of information transmitted on it. And it said that if you consider this single carrier wave as being space, and this sinusoid here as being a dimension, you could see that if you use the example of phase angle to multiplex radio data being transmitted all at the same time, then you might be able to space them individually and everything exists at the same time. So when we transmit radio waves, we sometimes transmit radio waves with multiplexed information, which means that we transmit a lot of different radio stations concurrently on the same carrier wave. And we do, we do this quite a lot. Now, if we look at it from the other... Sorry, I'll move back. If we look at it from this side here, we'll have a, a sort of a bullseye effect. And the, the source center said, if you consider that the center part here is your carrier wave, and that this part of angle here would be the difference in the different dimensions. You can see that each dimension can be in the same space concurrently by using the same area. So that was the source entity's way of explaining to me how the different dimensions can exist concurrently in the same space by using something that we as mankind use every day. We use multiplexing every day. Uh, a lot of your brand new cars, by the way, use a similar technology. And this is an excellent uh, image that the source led me to, to show you how all these different um, examples of, of, of dimension can exist concurrently. And there's about 12 there. But it said, make note, these areas here are where the links are, as a good example. These are where you can traverse the dimensions. Okay. 
So I want to summarize before I move on, because I want to move on to how we can ascend the frequencies. Because we talk about ascension a lot, and that's, that's frequency-based, as against dimensional-based. So the origin create, so the origin is the absolute, and it created 12 source entities to assist in its evolution. And the creator of our multiverse, source entity one, uh, because there's 12, although I only mention it as just the source entity in the book, created a multiverse, uh, and he populated it with ourselves. And that multiverse has 12 dimensions. The first three dimensional components of the first dimension create the physical universe. And if you think of it in our language, the, those first three dimensional components would probably equal height, width, and length. Okay? The higher dimensions are, are energetic. Although they may appear physical to the, the, the individual entities that are in there, they're energetic. Now, the dimensions are inflated with frequency bands to inflate them and allow progression. And those full dimensions are grouped in threes and linked. And it's the linking that enables an entity to move around and experience the various different things they can in different uh, permutations of the universe. Okay. So that each of the dimensions is inflated with a frequency. Twelve frequency bands. And if you remember, I said that each frequency band encompasses in our situation, all of the frequencies that we experience in the physical universe. So a dimension and a tritave component and a frequency band equal a permutation of space. So the source entity wants you to consider this, that an entity needs to move to the next dimension only as a function of evolution and movement through the frequencies first. So it can't move up to the next level unless it's able to ascend the frequencies in its, in its, its, dimension of, its, uh, its frequency of domicile. So what does that mean to us? We talk about ascension. We talk about uh, different areas of high frequency. But if you use this, 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 this example of frequency space, and um, if we consider this line down here as being the middle of a, of a base frequency. And these peaks up here has been the, the top end of the torrents and the bottom, the peaks down here, has been, the, the troughs down here has been the bottom end of the torrents. Then you can see that there's lots of potential evolutionary and devolution, devolutionary activity upon this particular uh, plane of frequency space. Now these areas here, where there's not a lot going on, will be areas where entities are working together and their, their evolutionary content is being negated by bad things or good things, or areas where they've worked well, but in areas where they've not worked well negates the, the, the upward movement. But these other areas here show where entities are working well together, and they're evolving as a result of it. Similarly, entities down here may not be working so well, and they may be rampaging around their particular universe, uh, warring with each other and uh, causing all sorts of merry hell. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. But the, What's more interesting is that these areas here are areas for, e for ascension or descension. And this next image gives you an example of that. If we were to take a two-dimensional view of that frequency space and think that actually we've got four dimensions here, or sort of four, four frequencies here, then an entity that's existing in the, upper, in the top end of its frequency space may well have an opportunity to ascend to the the next frequency upwards, if that, the lower end of that frequency is getting you know, is quite close to the upper end of the lower frequency. And this is because the frequencies undulate. Okay? One of the speakers yesterday talked about twitters and sudden portals appearing where we can see different realities or different points in time. Those are different areas of higher frequency we can, where, where things start to break down based upon the physicality. And what the source entity told me is that an entity, and we use these two areas here, who is highly evolved in a lower frequency, may well ascend to the next frequency level up if, if it's in contact with the lower content of that higher frequency. So you can see where an entity might evolve and ascend as a result of the, the interaction the, where there's areas of frequency touching each other, which is quite interesting, because otherwise you've got to do it by mechanical means. 
Now we talk about ascension and descension, and we talk about being incarnate, but the movement into the lower frequencies affects us quite significantly. And the source entity gave me an illustration of what happens to us as entities moving into the lower frequencies. And that also is relevant to our condition when we move into the, the incarnate state, because we're right down at the rock bottom. And he said, if we consider ourselves to be equal to all of the information on the World Wide Web, that includes everything in, the, in, the, in PCs, and that part of us that is incarnate is equivalent to being in a laptop computer. And then we consider the amount of memory space we've got on the hard drive of that computer. There's no way you can go anywhere near taking on board any of the massive amount of information in totality that's on the World Wide Web. That's us energetically. That's us right now. And the, the communication medium that goes between us gets smaller and smaller and smaller, or less and less capable as we move down to lower frequencies. So our opportunity to communicate with our higher selves gets less and less and less as we go down. So another good example is when we're energetic, we might have five million senses. We've got five here. So how the hell are we supposed to understand what's going on with ourselves? <laughs> and then we look at ourselves and we say, OK, let's imagine we're a computer. And uh, I want to get information off the World Wide Web. We use Google or we use Yahoo. We only get what we ask for. We ask a question. Um, I, want to know, I want to know where the local Walmart is. And it'll tell you where the local Walmart is. That's all you get. And that is the same with spiritual people, with mediums, with channelers like myself. You only get what you ask for, unless you ask, and if you ask different questions, you get more information. But we're limited to our capability. And this gives you an idea of how limited we are, because it's spiritual individuals who are using mediumship or channeling to access information, you've only got the capability of a search engine, to be honest, because you know, the information is there, is based upon the, the questions that you ask. But more importantly, we couldn't take, if we tried to understand everything, we don't have the disk space to get everything from the World Wide Web into our heads. We just, as the, as the computer would crash, well, we'd find ourselves in a psychiatric home, I think. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's look at something else we don't like to talk about, time. Now, one of my communications with the entity called Byron, okay, resulted in a communication on, on time. And uh, I said, what, what, about, what about this time thing, Byron? And he said, what about it? It doesn't exist. Well, we know that, don't we? And we all talk about time not existing, but it's, some, it's, a, it's, a, it's a favorite subject matter of, the, of those of us on the, on the Earth plane. And he said, but what you experience can be described as holographic event space. Hmm, that's a bit deep for me, I thought. And he said, this is because and because events occur in a holographic way, a particular event and all its alternatives can exist and do exist simultaneously, although they are separately. They're separately together. They're there separately, but they're simultaneously experienced. And that means that we can traverse them. Okay? We can, by using uh, technology or by using our own evolutionary content, move around the different experiences, the different events. And whilst I was uh, compiling this, um, this presentation, I, I, I chatted to the source entity and I said, how am I going to explain this? And it said, well, think of event space as a rubber band ball. And I stood there and thought, what does he mean, a rubber band ball? <laughs> and he said, well, think about it. If you think of each rubber band as a closed event and that each event is wrapped around each other, and that each event is in contact with each other, either directly or indirectly through contact with others, then all of those events can exist consistently. Not only that, all of the different events that are occurring are occurring simultaneously as well. So all of the times that I move out of this auditorium, for instance, and I turn right, all of the potential events that happen if I turn right can happen. Simultaneously. Similarly, if I move out 
and turn left, a whole bunch of different events that can occur are occurring as well. So we can't think of time as linear. It doesn't exist linearly. It exists as events. So I'm going to try and not use the word time anymore and use event space. So if you, if you spot me, please forgive me. It's quite difficult. It's been ingrained in me for quite a long time. So I'm going to summarize now because there's um, quite a lot of information to move into. OK. So an entity has to ascend the frequencies dimension of, of, of domicile, where it lives, before it can translate to the next dimension. And our physical existence in the lower frequencies results in a major loss of communication and function in variance to our higher energetic component. We can't do what we, do, we used to do in the, in the energy world. And time doesn't exist linearly as we perceive it, or think we perceive it on the Earth. It, it's, and it, it occurs holographically as events, separate events. And as, we, as a result of this, we can perceive it through various different methodologies or, or, or traverse it at will. So that sort of ends the, the part of the mechanics of the source entities universe. And I hope it's helped a little bit because it's, it is quite mechanical in, in, its, uh, in its delivery. But more importantly, it does show that, that actually we talk about universes and multiverses and that they do exist and they can exist. And they are existing con concurrently. I'm not, I'm not used time. So, okay. So why are, we, why, are, why are we here? What's the point in us being here right now? Well, we're here, we were created by the source entity to evolve. So we've all got the same remit. The source entity's got the remit, it wants to evolve to help the, the origin. And the origin wants to evolve. We, all, we are all here to evolve. And as we evolve, we pass it on to the source entity, and the source entity passes that evolutionary content onto the origin. It's great. Okay? So in doing this, our job is to experience and to learn from those experiences and to evolve as a result of it. And the real icing on the cake, in fact the cherry if you can, is if we can achieve self-realization whilst being in the physical, and by that I mean being fully aware and being able to access, if we're the computer, the whole of the World Wide Web without crashing, then we've made it. We've helped big time in terms of the evolution of the source entity and the origin. But we're also here to facilitate the ascension of this universe. And that is via the Earth's ascension. And the Earth is extremely important. And something that's come out of a recent piece of dialogue in another text of Rick written called Beyond the Source has indicated that there's a, a massive opportunity for us all to become equal with the source entity and the source entity to become equal to the origin. And that's not just our source entity and us with our source entity, that's all of the different entities that have been created by all of the other different source entities becoming equal to them, and then all of the source entities becoming equal to the origin. And then we all ascend together. Now what that means, I do not know. That's a new piece of information, and I find that really interesting, and I'll have to try and uh, dig into that further. Now we come on to the importance of the Earth. What's happened there? Okay, missed one. Okay. So, the Earth is an experiment in free will, and this is well documented. And this free will is designed to help accelerate evolution and create ascension. Now, as a, a, an area of local density, the the planet Earth is, uh, can be considered an important part of the physical universe. And in fact, you could consider it to be an important component within a computer. And right now, it doesn't work very well because it's right down in the frequency bands, okay? And that's created by ourselves. And without its circuits working, its ley lines, okay, it doesn't work properly and doesn't allow the rest of the circuit, the ley lines or, or wormholes, that, we've, that we've, we've talked about earlier, to work properly. And therefore, the rest of the universe doesn't work properly. So the ascension of the Earth is quite, quite important. So hence, the universe itself, this is the deal. The universe itself cannot ascend without Earth ascending. So there's no, no pressure there, guys. 
We're here to help the earth ascend, because when the earth ascends, the universe will ascend. That's big. That's big. That removes that layer of physicality. We move upwards, a big significant level. We go into the next level of frequency in the first dimension. So, we want the earth to survive this. We've not been very good to it. We've, created, we've allowed it to get down the frequencies. But we can make it move upwards, because it's pivotal. It's our way forwards. So, in order to support this, mankind was created. Okay? Now, when the origin started to become self-aware and investigate its own self, it realized that when it dipped into certain lower frequency areas, it experienced a higher and more rapid evolutionary growth content than it did in the higher frequencies. So when we were created, and we associated ourselves with the area of local density we call planet Earth, we had this information given to us. So experiencing the frequencies, the lower frequencies, accelerates the evolutionary progression. That's well known. But as higher energetic entities, we can't experience it properly. It's impossible. How can the wind experience sitting on a seat? Okay? How can the sea experience being ice unless it reduces its frequency? So we needed to associate ourselves in a more robust way with the lower frequencies. And that meant that we needed to have a vehicle to do it so that we could experience the physical whilst being in the physical. Now, energetic mankind um, had a, a committee of people together, or committee of entities together, to help work out how we're going to do this. And that resulted in the human form being created. Now, the human form was... There's the three versions of the human form, and this is the first one. And the first human form wasn't as dense as it is, is now. This is quite dense. Yeah? Forget what, the, what you think about the speaker, we're dense. Okay? We're really quite low down the frequency levels. But at that point in time, we weren't. We were really quite high. So the human body was uh, almost waif-like in form. And that allowed higher energy entities, uh, you know, energetic mankind, to go down into the physical at that point in time and experience the physical whilst being in the physical. But we were all linked together. Now, what that meant was that every, every entity that was incarnate was in a soul group or individual was in contact continuously with each other. So, for instance, all of you, if you were incarnate, would be in, con in continuous communication on an involuntary level with each other all at the same time. So I'll be experiencing what you're experiencing, and you'll be experiencing what the lady over there is experiencing, that lady over there experiencing, what that uh, gentleman over there is experiencing, all concurrently. So we're all experiencing everybody else's evolutionary content simultaneously. And we were doing quite well. But it created a level of infatuation with the physical. Now, to reproduce the bodies, uh, we didn't have conceptions we have now. We had to be able to take every third or fourth cell and put them out of phase. So we ended up with a fully grown body. So the, the master body would be here, and we'd put every third or fourth side of phase, and we'd have another body here, and another body here, and another body here, which is, which is great. That's the way it worked out well. But because of the infatuation with the physical, it became unstable because it was a, it was a higher frequency uh, construct, construct in a, a lower frequency environment, a continuous lower frequency environment. And that led to... Um, a significant amount of energetic dysfunctions due to mutation of that form, which affected, in a most profound way, those entities who were incarnate in the physical. And what's more, because we were linked to our soul groups, and some of those weren't incarnate, they were also being affected as well. So there was an awful lot of dysfunction going on. And this was so profound that it created concern with the the committee of entities that created the, the body and they wanted to change it to the next level. So the second human form 
was created. And it was limited. It was limited to a reproduction basis based on one-on-one. -on -one. So the separation of the, the every third or fourth cell going out of phase happened once. And it happened earlier. So that the, the body itself um, didn't mutate so badly. Okay. The link to the other souls was also disconnected. Although we could still talk to each other, that instantaneous communication had gone. Okay? So that meant that we were able to communicate with each other, but we had to stay where we, stay where we were. Now, at that point in time, the, the word got out that there's some serious evolution to be had in the Earth plane. And uh, as a result of that, other entities came in and started to share the bodies, which created more energetic dysfunction because those entities left an energetic imprint on that human body. So as another entity came in and shared the body to experience, it picked up the imprint of the first entity, but left its own imprint as well. So as the next entity came in, it picked up the imprint of the first two entities, left its own, own imprint there. And the fourth entity came in, it picked up the imprint of the first three entities, left its own imprint in there. And that meant that the, the entities eventually got to a point where the, the dysfunction was so compounded that they were totally out of it, and they had to be taken away and... Uh, looked after by their guides, and it took them many thousands of solar years to get back to the point where they could even think about reincarnating again. So that led to a number of changes to make the human body robust. We reduced the number of bodily incarnations to one per spirit. We reduced the ability to move to other bodies once incarnate, and removed the connections between spirits whilst incarnate, including memory of such abilities. They don't worry about what they can't remember, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay? But we'd reinstate those when she became unincarnate, disincarnate. And the body had to be created that was more robust in its capabilities. And also we had to package protect for going down the potential to go to the lowest frequencies possible, which we now know happened. So that created the third form, which was initially hermaphroditic in reproduction. But that was um, fundamentally flawed because as we were going down the frequencies and viruses and bacteria started to take hold in the human form, it was quite possible for a whole reproduction line to be wiped out as a result of gaining a virus or a, or a bad bacteria. So the diversification of the reproduction process was required. And that meant that the blueprint for creativity and the reproduction process was shared between two bodies rather than one, making that body more robust, simpler, and uh, altogether made it last a lot longer. And it shared immunity as a result of that, making it more robust and, and more able to combat those viruses it was starting to experience. And gestation was made faster in a more convenient and internal environment, removing the opportunity for these viruses and bacteria to attack it. So I'm going to summarise now before moving on to the final phase of the presentation. So really, we're here to learn who we really are and to help the Earth ascend ultimately assisting in the source entity and thus the origins of evolution. And mankind needs to raise the frequencies of the Earth as it's an important part of the universe and its energy grid. And to assist mankind to create the physical form to allow us to experience the physical whilst being in the physical and accelerate evolution. And the current human form is the, is the third version, but that's had two reproduction uh, models, as it were, Mark II. So, okay, I want to go over the spiritual functions of RNA and DNA because it's a quite important concept. Now, physically, we understand how RNA works with DNA. Okay? The RNA is the medium which transmits the programming in current popular science from DNA to the proteins which are used in cell function. That's the method that tells the cell what to be. This cell is going to be a liver, a liver cell, or a heart cell, or an eye cell. And it's the, the communication medium between the RNA and DNA which does that. However, there's many more functions involved with the RNA than meets the eye. RNA is actually uh, quite a multifunctional piece of development. And it exists in two planes of existence simultaneously. So it exists in the physical, and it exists in the spiritual physical. And 
When the human body is created, or the cells are, are told to be what they are, the information coming from the uh, etheric template in the etheric body gets passed on to the energetic content of the RNA, which then promulgates down to the physical content of the RNA. It then tells the DNA what it's supposed to be. DNA uh, replicates, then communicates that replication sequence via the RNA to the cell protein, which creates the, the cell it's supposed to be, the liver cell. But it's a closed loop system. So once the liver cell is a liver cell, and it's in the right position within the liver, it then needs to tell the, uh, the etheric template that it's got the right information and it's, and it's doing what it's supposed to do. So then it feeds back through the RNA, the physical part of the RNA, up to the spiritual physical part of the RNA, which is fed back into the etheric template. So it's a feedback loop, quite a nice feedback loop. So the spiritual function of the RNA is an interface medium that exists in both the physical and the lower spiritual levels. And it also helps the cell know where it's going to. So it allows cells to communicate with each other. And allows this feedback function to the etheric template and the etheric body. And interestingly enough, the wider roles of RNA are now starting to be understood by science. And they now recognise that RNA actually interferes with DNA post-DNA replication, which is quite an important piece of science. Okay, so we'll talk about the uh, three in one aspect of the human body. Okay. The human body is quite a, a unique piece of equipment because it exists in three planes of existence concurrently. It exists in the physical, the spiritual physical, and the purely spiritual. And it's this three in one concept that religions have tried to maintain in, in teaching and understanding. And, and without being uh, too radical, it's the, if you like, the Father would be the spiritual physical, the Son would be the physical, and the Holy Ghost would end up being the spiritual side. And if you put it further up, the Father would be the source entity, the Son would be us, and the Holy Ghost would be the origin. So there's quite a lot of information there. So before we go to the final piece of information, oops, have I... Uh, Okay. One, one. okay. Before we go into the final piece of uh, communication with the source entity, before we finish, I want to go over karma. Now, karma is a localised decrease in frequency of a specific entity or a group of entities. And, it, and we know it slows down the evolution uh, and it stops ascension to the higher frequencies. But karma can be generated, as we know, by poor deeds, but more importantly, by the infatuation or attraction to the lower physical sensory stimuli. Okay? And, but karma can be good in ascending. And the source entity gave me an example of karma being relevant to a sea anchor. Now, a sea anchor is a parachute that uh, a mariner, a sailor, might put into the water if, he's, if the length of rope he's got for his, his anchor, his warp, is not long enough to meet the seabed. But he needs to keep his boat into the wind and into the sea if he's lost his motor function or his, or his sails. He said, so consider the, the, the sea anchor as karma and consider the boat as you being incarnate and the air as being a higher frequency and the, the sea as being a lower frequency. He <laughs> said that minimal karma might be people who are spiritually aware, if you like. They're starting to understand that the selfless life, the life of service is the way forwards. And they're trying, starting to renounce certain physical desires, uh, material wealth, material ownership, to enable them to get more closer to God. But little insidious parts of karma sneaking, like fears, uh, fears of flying, for instance, or turbulence, or fears of driving in cars, or fears of water. And those little things also sneak in and cause attraction to the physical. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> he also said he might get major karma. And major karma might be uh, relevant to somebody who's incarnate who really doesn't have any desire to be involved in anything spiritual. Okay? All they're interested in is their, is their material wealth, their material world. You know, I'm not going to be incarnate. I'm, not gonna, I'm going to live life to the full because I, it, I'm just here for one go. That's it. And I don't care who I tread over to do it. <laughs> the problem with that is... <laughs> With a, with a sea anchor that big, you might be sucked under the, under the waves and become, uh, as in, 
go down even further in the, into the frequencies. But karma can be good. And if you think about it, if you're working correctly and you, you are working selflessly and, and you start to work out your own inhibitions, actually, this image here, where you, your sea anchor could turn into a parachute and it could pull you up the frequencies. And you can get to a point where you're looking down on everybody else who has stayed where they are and you're starting to rise up the frequencies. So I'd just like to quickly summarise this information before we move on to a message from the source entity. So the RNA has additional important roles as it passes information from the higher spiritual energy to the lower energy physical body. And the human body is associated with different levels of physical, spiritual, physical and purely spiritual levels, this three in one uh, aspect. And the karma is a, is a localised loss of frequency which can affect uh, a group of entities or a, or a specific entity. And, but it, and it links us to the physical world, basically. But it can be good. And if we, if we work it out right, we understand what it is, we can start ascending the frequencies of result. But there is no right and no wrong. There is just experience. And if we have an experience we believe is suboptimal, we don't like it. But as long as we understand what the reasons for that experience was and we work forwards with it, then we can turn a potentially bad experience into good evolution and therefore positive karma. Okay, so in finishing the lecture, the source entity wants us to consider the bigger picture. Okay? Every one of us here has a little part of the bigger picture. And we should therefore consider this before thinking what the bigger picture is. Now, my big picture might be equal to this place in Crete. Okay? Wonderful area. But the doing the work I do, I could get egotistical and think that that's it. And some people do. They think that what they're doing is that is all there is to it. But actually, that bigger picture is a small part of a bigger picture. And if we stand back from that, we can see that actually we don't know that much. And that bigger picture is represented by this nice cuddly dog. Okay? <laughs> but that bigger picture, if we stand back even further, is relevant to another bigger picture. And that bigger picture is represented by the, uh, the gentleman who's photo mosaics I've borrowed, Mr. Philip Tyrone. Thank you very much, Philip. But he's even part of a, of a larger picture. So we start to see that our big picture, or what we think we know, is actually quite, quite small. And we can move back further and further and further until eventually we get to the point where we get to the source entity and ultimately the origin. <laughs> what the source entity said to me is just ask everybody to think about talking to each other about what their big picture is. Because if we can understand somebody else's picture, then we become two pictures, or three pictures together, or four pictures together, and we start to work together in, in, in synchronicity rather than isolation. And in doing that, we need to con you know, constantly question our physicality. Okay. And that's it. And what I'd like to do now, if we've got a little bit of time, is to quickly... <laughs> It's just, just, just a little experiment, okay? If, if, um, a bit of group work, and I'd like to involve those people. If we've got time, Dolores, how are we doing? Got 10 minutes? Rather than take questions, he wants to do an exercise with the audience. But it's up to you guys. Do you want questions and answers, or do you want the exercise? <laughs> Because you, you can ask questions when he's back at his table. <laughs> I'll give tell, you an honest. <laughs> tell him what you want to teach him how to do. Okay. What I wanted to teach you how to do was to be able to rise through the frequencies up to the seventh level, which was the edge of the spiritual physical uh, aspect of your bodies. If you wanted to understand that uh, later, then we can, if you, if you meet me afterwards in the book signing area, then I'll can probably take a little group of you to one side and we can, we can experience that. Uh, because it'll enable, it, it will enable you to use the mechanical methods that I used originally to get to a certain level. And then if you use the instructions in the back of the book, you can then start to go further up. But doing it as a little group would be, would be great. So if anybody wants to do that, then you can meet me outside, and uh, we'll get together and, and, and do a little, uh, little bit of group work there. But uh, I'm quite happy to do questions and answers right now. Yeah, um, do you want to do questions? Well, they just said they want to do questions and answers right now. Exercise. Oh, okay. Right. 
Okay, so let's consider everybody here and their physicality. Okay, so normally we do this standing up, but we'll sit down right now. And the, let's include the people in the, uh, who are looking at this via the, the streaming as well, because there's opportunity for a triangulation here. So if you sit in your, in your chair, okay, and you put your hands just, just here, okay, I'll turn around so you can see from the side as well, this way, okay, and close your eyes a moment. And keep your eyes closed, okay? And I'll, I'll hold the energy, because it's important to hold the energy. Now I want you to forget about everything that's around you, everybody else that's around you. And I want you to just be who you are in the dark. Okay? Fine. That's good. That's excellent. Now, I want you to imagine that the side of you, there's an anchor point. And that anchor point's got a rope. And I want you to mentally wrap that part of that rope around your middle. Okay? And that's your link. That's your grounding. That'll keep you safe. And that'll move with you as you move up the frequencies, okay? So just wrap that around you and just sit there and, and consider that you've got this, this anchor to the earth, to the lower, lower, lower planes, and that you're quite happy. Okay. Now the way to go up to the first level, which is equal to the first auric level, is to do a technique we used to use uh, with my healing instructor by spinning the chakras. Now first you have to extend the chakras. And the first chakra, the base chakra, is situated uh, in the groin area. So what I want you to do is to just imagine a cone extending out from your groin towards the floor. Okay. Ooh, yes. Energy's rising. Excellent. And then rotating or spinning that chakra in a clockwise fashion, in the way that you would see it. Okay? Okay, we're moving up. Good. Yeah, you're getting there. Okay, let's just sit there for a bit. Okay, just sit there for a bit. Feel that energy associated with that first level. You've moved up a level. That's excellent. Good. Okay. Now, while we're doing this, anybody who feels uncomfortable by going to another level, just stay at the level you're comfortable at, and we'll catch you on the way down. So don't, don't, don't worry, okay? So let's move up to the next level now, because you've moved them quite easily, which is great, okay? We're going to use the sacral chakra, which is around your belly button area. Now, I want you to extend the cone of your sacral chakra out. Extend that out. Okay? And then rotate it clockwise as you see it, okay? Ah, here we go, here we go. You can rotate it mentally or by using your fingers, that's not a problem, either way is fine. And then sit in that chakra area. So you move up from the base chakra to the sacral chakra area. So sit in that chakra area, okay. So you're now at the second level, second level of frequency, okay? Excellent, this is good. They're good, these people. They're good. Okay. So, if you're happy to stay there, stay there. If you want to move on, let's go to the third. The solar chakra is where the sternum is. Okay? This bit's where your rib cage finishes. Extend the cone of that chakra out. Ooh, there's some big chakras here. <laughs> okay. And then rotate that clockwise as you see it. And then, if you're comfortable, move into that chakra area. There's some good energy here. And don't forget, people who are watching this via streaming, please also take part in it. This is, uh, and this can happen, this will all co um, correspond together in the correct event space, even though you might be doing it in a week's time. So don't worry if you're watching this in a week, you know, in two or three weeks' time. The event space is one. So don't, don't worry about that. Okay, where we are now, the third level, is the last part of your physicality. We're going to move now to the fourth level, which is via the heart chakra. And the heart chakra is just, just below, well, where my microphone is, yes, just, just there, just below your neck, okay? So extend that 
cone out. If you want to stay at the third level, do so. Those who want to carry on, extend that chakra out and rotate it clockwise as you see it. And then move into that chakra. Okay? Ah. And the energy gets finer. The first chakra energy was denser, okay, more sticky. And we're now to the fourth chakra level. You are moving out of your pure physicality. You're now in spiritual physicality, this area of intermediacy between the spiritual and the physical. That's good. The energies are getting finer. Excellent. Keep going, everybody. You're doing well. We'll sit there for a bit. Ah, you're all okay. Good. So we'll now move on to the fifth chakra, the th throat chakra. So again, extend that cone out and rotate it clockwise as you see it. And then move into it when you're ready. And then you start to see or feel the energy is getting finer again. Okay, anybody who wanted to stay in the fourth, stay there. Don't worry, we'll, you can come back with us when we come down. There's no problem. You're totally safe because you've got your anchor point. Now, those of you who've gone to the fifth, just check on your rope and make sure that you're still attached to the ground. It will be. I'm holding the energy, don't worry. That's your grounding. Any images that you start to receive, observe them as an observer, not as yourself. There is nothing here that can hurt you. The images are just pure images. Your observer self is observing them nonchalantly, like somebody watching a film. Okay, we're there. Those of you who want to stay in the fifth, stay there. Those who want to go to the sixth, extend that cone, that, uh, that chakra, out of your third eye. Move it out. Rotate it clockwise as you see it. Now all of these chakras at the front of your body, there are chakras at the back as well, don't worry. It's not important to worry about those right now. It's just the front. The front are your intention. Okay, we're getting there now. Ooh, the energy's getting quite high. Excellent. I can feel the energy getting higher and more finer. Okay. Excellent. This is good. You can do this on your own at home. So the instructions are in the book. Everybody's there now? Yes. Okay. If you're happy with that, stay there. If you want to go to the seventh level, which will take you to the edge of your spiritual physical condition. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So that's your cr crown chakra, that's up above your head. Extend that upwards, extend the cone upwards, and again rotate it as you would see if you were looking upwards in clockwise fashion. Okay? That's it. And you'll find if you move into your ch crown chakra area, that you are, you might, find slight, might feel slightly giddy or heady, okay? Don't worry, nothing wrong with that. You are there. I think you've done extremely well so far. You're keeping going, you're grounded, you're safe, okay? Okay, I'm going to go one, one more level higher and take you into your pure spiritual area now. Because you've done so well. The pure spiritual area is that area that exists as the first contact with your energetic selves, your higher selves. So I want you to think of where you are now and see a set of steps in front of you. Five steps. And letter eight in front of you in those steps. So you're walking up a set of steps and the wall in front of you that says letter eight, and the steps that go further. So those of you who want to, walk up those steps. First step, second step, 
third step, fourth step, fifth step. You are now totally associated with your spirituality. That part of you which is spiritual. You're getting closer to your energetic self. Okay? Two more levels to go. And we'll be at the edge of our, our beingness. Look to the left of you and see another, you'll see another set of steps. Five steps, and on the wall is nine. If you're happy to stay at level eight, stay there. If you want to go to level nine, walk up those steps. There's only five steps. Nice and easy, just walk up them. First step, second step, third step, fourth step, fifth step. There's the number nine. And notice now how you become really quite light-headed. You are outside of anything that is considered to be, in reality, physical. Okay. We'll do the last one. You've all done so well, I think you should be rewarded by going to the edge of your, your bodily condition, that that is associated with the physical. There's one more staircase to the left. Ten steps, letter ten on the wall. Okay. First step. Second step. Third step. Fourth step, fifth step. Now we'll just stay there. Now just absorb the energy that's there. Feel how calm you feel. Feel how unimportant physical life is. Those of you who are naturally more evolved might notice some of your spirit guides around. Say hi to them. They're there to help you. They're pleased to see you. Okay? It's been quite some event space before they've seen you. In this condition. At this level of awareness in doing it. Okay? You're still anchored. You've still got your rope there. So you're still safe. Okay? That's good. Let's just sit there a moment. Now the walls of the area are going to drop down now and you're going to see what that level really is. And you'll, each of you may get a different image in terms of your evolutionary content. So that wall will now drop down and you will see and experience the vista that is at the edge of your beingness in, our, in, in incarnate mankind in any form of, of physical, spiritual, physical, or spiritual. I can see a lot of you are seeing the country hills <laughs> and blue skies. That's great. Okay, what I want you to do now is, is try and feel and memorize what you feel there. Experience where you are now. Remember it in every cell of your body, every part of your beingness, every layer of your consciousness. You're as close as you're going to get to your energetic component without being disincarnate and without self-awareness. Okay. So what I want you to do now is, uh, is now to turn around and say Cheerio to those people that you may have met, if you've met, some of you have met guides, or some of you have met animals, or some of you have just experienced the view. And walk back down those steps now, five steps down to level number nine. Okay? And your rope will retract naturally. So your safety line to the earth will retract naturally as you walk down. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, at level nine. Going down is easier. It doesn't take so much thought or concentration. So we'll continue to walk down to the eighth level. Five, four, three, two, one. 
Okay, the rope's retracting, you're safe still, you're at eight. Those who stayed at eight and nine have come down with us. Okay. We'll now move down to number seven. So we're moving down the steps into our seventh chakra. Okay, our crown chakra. So walk down those steps. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we brought those people on the eighth down to the seventh, and those who have stayed on the seventh are meeting now. So now I want you to just retract your chakra back into your crown and then move down to the sixth level. Those who stayed on the sixth, we say hi to them. Okay, now we're stabilized. Now move down to the fifth by retracting the sixth chakra. Move that back into you, your spiritual eye. Move down to your throat chakra area. Okay, and those who stayed at the fifth, we meet those and say hello. Good. Now I want you to move down to the fourth by retracting the fifth chakra. Move down. That's it. No rush, slowly does it. Okay. We meet those in the fourth who stayed there. Good. We can get down to the third now by retracting the fourth chakra. And you might find that you still re resonate at the higher frequencies right now. That's good. Hold on to that. We've raised your frequency. This is helping the ascension of this planet. And it's helping the ascension of the planet by triangulation, by those people who've participated by the streaming of this information via the internet. So the fourth chakra is fully retracted. We're in the third. We meet the people who left the state on the third. Move down to the second by retracting the third. Okay. Good. And we can now move down to the first by retracting the second, retracting the sacral chakra. And people who stay at the first, that's fine. We're now meeting them. Good. Okay, yes, we're all there now. Yep. Okay, now, to, now come back down to the total physical by retracting your base chakra. Move that back into your body. Okay, some of you may experience the change in the frequencies, how they feel. Your hands might tingle differently. Your head might feel like it's got a bit of a headache coming. But you're doing okay. And just sit there for a moment, back in the physical, where you are now. Okay, you've experienced quite some high energies there. Not many people get a chance to do that on a regular basis. You should be pleased with yourselves. You're doing extremely well. You've gone to the edge of your beingness as an incarnate human being. You've gone right to the edge of that third component that is in the spiritual as against being the physical. Okay? Open your eyes now. How do you feel? Okay? A bit woozy? Yeah? <laughs> well done, everybody. She gives her a clap. Well done. You can use that method any time you want to. The, the, you can go further if you need to by using the steps or by using an elevator to go higher as well. Um, okay, the, the, the instructions are in the back of the book, fine. If anybody wants to, to go further again, um, during lunchtime I'll be around the book signing area. So, thank you very much again. Thank you for your attention and your event space.